Beaumarche, you can succeed while being weird. It's not every day that you read a book about someone from the 1700s that pisses you off today, but hot damn if that didn't happen when I read Maurice Laver's unbelievable biography about Pierre Augustin Caron de Beaumarche, the man who famously said, my life is a combat, and boy was that ever true. I'm Ross Palmer, and through my podcast, Beat the Often Path, and this channel, I've made it my life's work to celebrate people who haven't gotten the attention they deserve. Beaumarchais is one of those people, and if you're American and you don't know who he is, realize that you've been duped, rooked, swindled, soaked, hoodwinked. But first, smash that subscribe button and turn on those notifications for a steady stream of inspiration on how to build a life and career on your own terms. Let's go on. When you're thinking about reading a biography, there's nothing you like to see more than 375 pages staring at you of fine print. Oh boy, this is gonna take a while, you say, flipping back to write it on your phone. Truth be told, Maurice Laver did a phenomenal job with this book, and it's easily one of the most well-written and genuinely exciting biographies I've ever read. 376 pages and not a word of fluff in there. That's how remarkable Beaumarchais' life was. But what do we know about Beaumarchais, and how can his story help you in your own life and career, especially if you've had some setbacks, you're struggling, or you just don't seem to fit neatly into any kind of box? Pierre Augustin was a polymath like da Vinci, and he was someone who had tons of wide-ranging interests and passions. I seek out people like him in a world where we're constantly told we need to specialize in order to succeed. Did Beaumarchais specialize? The man who pioneered watchmaking at the age of 21, making them actually, you know, accurate for the first time ever. The man who then went on to write The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro, two of the most famous plays of French history, before becoming an instrumental part of the American Revolution, without whose help it's quite probable that the U.S. wouldn't have existed at all. And then he was completely backstabbed by the country that he helped create and one of the world's great examples of all-time douche fuckery in which the Continental Congress refused to pay back the millions of aid and arms he gave them for decades, and that's why Americans aren't celebrating this man, even though he should be an American hero. The man who fought for 18 years to pioneer the concept of author's copyright against considerable resistance in a time where playwrights earned nothing and all of the money went to actors. The man who created the first union for writers and generally revolutionized a ton of shit all while being a flamboyant, essentially pansexual libertine who kept a steady stream of women and maybe men at his disposal his whole life? Now that doesn't sound like somebody who specialized to me. His whole life, no one believed that Beaumarchais could be one thing and another. How can you be a celebrated playwright and a serious secret agent? Can you imagine when the prudish Ben Franklin learned that this open and ostentatious, foppish libertine was behind America's success against the British? It probably nearly made his puritanical head explode. But that's just who Beaumarchais was, for better or for worse. And how could someone be a playwright and a spy? How could someone be a wealthy financier and a struggling artist? How could anyone rise from being a humble watchmaker to the rank of nobleman, serving not one but several King Louis? How could someone like that risk his wealth and his life for some colonies that never repaid their debt, nearly ruining him? I love Beaumarchais' story because it shows us that true genius can triumph over all, even if that triumph takes many years or even decades. As he said himself, his life truly was a combat. In fact, the vicissitudes of his own fortune were extreme. Nearly every positive thing in his life was directly followed by an equally negative counterpoint. After he invented a groundbreaking watch escapement, this invention was stolen from him. As would be a theme in his life, he was forced to use his cunning and the power of his pen to sway public opinion and win back his own invention, catching the eye of the noble class for the first time. He married, then his wife died, then he married again, then his wife died again, then he was betrayed and lost everything and was tied up in court on false accusations for many, many years of his life. He had a taste of nobility, then it was plucked away from him. But never one to give up, he used his cunning to weasel his way back into the good graces of King Louis XV as a spy, acting as plenipotentiary to help him squelch dissenting pamphlets across Europe that the king wanted subdued. Oh, did I mention that he wrote The Barber of Seville, one of the most enduring plays of the French stage in the meantime, and Opening Night? That play was a complete flop, but then he tweaked it and tweaked it until it became a hit. And just, folks, just as he got back into the good graces of King Louis XV, the king dies! And Louis XVI hated him, back to square one again. His second play, The Marriage of Figaro, took years of effort to finally be accepted by the monarch he had criticized. Literally everything he undertook was an enormous struggle. But Beaumarchais' chief trait was that he never gave up. 
So he found ways of injecting himself into French affairs, desperately seeking to be a representative of the new king. After much distrust, he finally found his way into Louis XVI's ear, positioning himself as a liaison and a spy. While he was doing this, Beaumarchais was busy fighting for the rights of playwrights everywhere who previously didn't get the credit or money they deserved. This 18-year struggle would see him establish the modern copyright system as we know it, whereby authors are acknowledged as the, you know, creators of their work. It sounds basic, but it didn't exist before him, and it was a hell of a fight to get there. Back to spying. Beaumarchais learned of America's fight against the British, and having battled his whole life for wealth and essentially a caste system, he identified with the Americans and sought to help them at great personal expense and risk. He contributed millions of livres worth of weapons and aid to the American cause, and by many accounts, America couldn't have possibly won the war or key battles without his financial help, at a time when the colony's own economy was on the verge of collapse. Basically, the U.S. might only be a country today thanks to his extreme personal effort to provide arms and supplies to an emerging country that had not nearly enough. Even though John Jay and Jefferson and other people initially said things to the effect of, we can't possibly thank you enough, you're a hero, we'll pay you back in sweet, sweet Virginia tobacco right away. They soon went back on their word after Congress basically convinced themselves, thanks to dumbass assholes like Arthur Lee, that Beaumarchais hadn't really given them anything at all after they'd won the war. Beaumarchais spent decades trying to get repaid, and again, we're talking about millions here, and again, thanks to world-class piece of shit Arthur Lee, the Congress was somehow convinced that Beaumarchais, having given everything to the Americans over the course of years, was actually, actually himself somehow owed the U.S. money, and an example of crooked accounting that would make Enron blush. It wasn't until Alexander Hamilton finally looked at the accounts over 12 years later and said, hey, this isn't right, that anybody even looked at the debt, let alone repaid it or acknowledged it. Can you imagine hounding somebody for over a decade while your own life is crumbling and getting insulted for your troubles? But that's the kind of life Beaumarchais had. My life is a combat. He fought his whole life in a system that was constantly trying to reject him. He's possibly one of the greatest examples out there of turning adversity into triumph time and again through nothing more than sheer will and force of determination. At first, he was hated by the nobility, then accepted by them, then hated, then loved by them again, then hated. He was loved by the people for his work, then hated by the people when he became rich with his new big house getting looted and his staff's decapitated heads put on a pike. Now life's a bitch, ain't it? At this point, you might be thinking, wow, that's one hell of a biography. No wonder it's 376 pages long. And the lesson might be, if you're an unusual person, how can you live a life such that your biography would need 376 pages to fully explain it all? So what's the moral of this story for you? What can you learn from this? I think there are two things to be gained from this remarkable tale. One, if you're traveling on an unusual path, it's to be expected that you occasionally stumble or even have to go back to square one. It's also likely that many different people from many different walks of life won't understand you for one reason or another. It might take you years or even decades to get your footing, and that's okay. Remember that his battles were sadly measured in decades, not in hours or in days. But that brings us to takeaway number two. If you keep getting back up, no matter what the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune throw your way, you can change the world and become someone truly remarkable. If Beaumarchais had accepted initial defeat, he would have quit literally dozens of times in his life. In fact, most normal people would have quit his life by the time he was 25. But if you are intelligent, if you have wide-ranging interests and passions, keep pushing forward for what you believe in, even if you can't see how those things are connected. In some way or another, you can succeed in all of them. And also, your personal success will likely come when you attach yourself to a cause greater than you, such as the next American Revolution or big movement that you see around you. Just... Don't expect to be paid back if you loan an American money, because apparently some of us have always been dicks.